LibriVox.org. King Solomon's Mines by H. Ryder Haggard Chapter 16 The Place of Death It was already dark on the third day after the scene described in the previous chapter when we camped in some huts at the foot of the Three Witches, as the Triangle of Mountains is called, to which Solomon's Great Road runs. Our party consisted of our three selves and Fulata, who waited on us, especially on good, Enfadus, Gagul, who was borne along in a litter, inside which she could be heard muttering and cursing all day long, and a party of guards and attendants. The mountains, or rather the three peaks of the mountain, for the mass was evidently the result of a solitary upheaval, were, as I have said, in the form of a triangle, of which the base was towards us, one peak being on our right, one on our left, and one straight in front of us. Never shall I forget the sight afforded by those three towering peaks in the early sunlight of the following morning. High, high above us, up into the blue air, soared their twisted snow wreaths. Beneath the snow line the peaks were purple with heaths, and so were the wild moors that ran up the slope towards them. Straight before us the white ribbon of Solomon's Great Road stretched away uphill to the foot of the center peak, about five miles from us, and there stopped. It was its terminus. I had better leave the feelings of intense excitement with which we set out on our march that morning to the imagination of those who read this history. At last we were drawing near to the wonderful mines that had been the cause of the miserable death of the old Portuguese Dom three centuries ago, of my poor friend, his ill-starred descendant, and also, as we feared, of George Curtis, Sir Henry's brother. Were we destined, after all that we had gone through, to fare any better? Evil befell them, as that old fiend Gagool said. Would it also befall us? Somehow, as we were marching up that last stretch of beautiful road, I could not help feeling a little superstitious about the matter. And so, I think, did good and Sir Henry. For an hour and a half or more we tramped on up the heather-fringed way, going so fast in our excitement that the bearers of Gagool's hammock could scarcely keep pace with us, and its occupant piped out to us to stop. Walk more slowly, white men, she said, projecting her hideous shriveled countenance between the grass curtains and fixing her gleaming eyes upon us. Why will you run to meet the evil that shall befall you, ye seekers after treasure? and she laughed that horrible laugh which always sent a cold shiver down my back, and for a while quite took the enthusiasm out of us. However, on we went, till we saw before us, and between ourselves and the peak, a vast circular hole with sloping sides, three hundred feet or more in depth, and quite half a mile around. "'Can't you guess what this is?' I said to Sir Henry and Good, who were staring in astonishment at the awful pit before us. They shook their heads. Then it is clear that you have never seen the diamond diggings at Kimberley. You may depend on it that this is Solomon's diamond mine, pointing to the strata of stiff blue clay which were yet to be seen among the grass and bushes that clothed the sides of the pit. The formation is the same. I'll be bound that if we went down there we should find pipes of soapy, brecciated rock. Look, too, and I pointed to a series of worn flat slabs of stone that were placed on a gentle slope below the level of a watercourse 
which in some past age had been cut out of the solid rock. If those are not tables once used to wash the stuff, I'm a Dutchman. At the edge of this vast hole, which was none other than the pit marked on the old Dom's map, the great road branched into two and circumvented it. In many places, by the way, this surrounding road was built entirely out of blocks of stone, apparently with the object of supporting the edges of the pit and preventing falls of reef. Along this path we pressed, driven by curiosity, to see what were the three towering objects which we could discern from the hither side of the great gulf. As we drew near we perceived that they were colossi of some sort or another, and rightly conjectured that before us sat the three silent ones, that are held in such awe by the Kukuana people. But it was not until we were quite close to them that we recognized the full majesty of these silent ones. There, upon huge pedestals of dark rock, sculptured with rude emblems of the Phallic worship, separated from each other by a distance of forty paces, and looking down the road which crossed some sixty miles of plain to Lu were three colossal seated forms, two male and one female, each measuring about thirty feet from the crown of its head to the pedestal. The female form, which was nude, was of great though severe beauty, but unfortunately the features had been injured by centuries of exposure to the weather. Rising from either side of her head were the points of a crescent, the two male colossi, on the contrary, were draped, and presented a terrifying cast of features, especially the one to our right, which had the face of a devil. That to our left was serene in countenance, but the calm upon it seemed dreadful. It was the calm of that inhuman cruelty, Sir Henry remarked, which the ancients attributed to being potent for good who could yet watch the sufferings of humanity, if not without rejoicing, at least without sorrow. These three statues form a most awe-inspiring trinity, as they sit there in their solitude and gaze out across the plain forever. Contemplating these silent ones, as the Kukuanas call them, an intense curiosity again seized us to know whose were the hands which had shaped them. Who was it that had dug the pit and made the road? Whilst I was gazing and wondering, suddenly it occurred to me, being familiar with the Old Testament, that Solomon went astray after strange gods, the names of three of whom I remembered, Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, and Milcom, the god of the children of Ammon. And I suggested to my companions that the figures before us might represent these false and exploded divinities. Hmm, said Sir Henry, who is a scholar, having taken a high degree in classics at college. There may be something in that. Ashtoreth of the Hebrews was the Astarte of the Phoenicians, who were the great traders of Solomon's time. Astarte, who afterwards became the Aphrodite of the Greeks, was represented with horns like the half-moon, and there on the brow of the female figure are distinct horns. Perhaps these colossi were designed by some Phoenician official who managed the mines. Who can say? Note. Compare Milton, Paradise Lost, Book One. With these in troop came Ashtoreth, whom the Phoenicians called Astarte, Queen of Heaven, with crescent horns, to whose bright image nightly by the moon Sidonian virgins paid their vows and songs. 
before we had finished examining these extraordinary relics of remote antiquity, Infadus came up, and having saluted the silent ones by lifting his spear, asked us if we intended entering the place of death at once, or if we would wait till after we had taken food at midday. If we were ready to go at once, Gagool had announced her willingness to guide us. As it was not later than eleven o'clock, driven to it by a burning curiosity, we announced our intention of proceeding instantly, and I suggested that, in case we should be detained in the cave, we should take some food with us. Accordingly, Gagool's litter was brought up, and that lady herself assisted out of it. Meanwhile, Fulata, at my request, stored some biltong, or dried game flesh, together with a couple of gourds of water, in a reed basket with a hinged cover. Straight in front of us, at a distance of some fifty paces from the backs of the colossi, rose a sheer wall of rock, eighty feet or more in height, that gradually sloped upwards till it formed the base of the lofty, snow-wreathed peak, which soared into the air three thousand feet above us. As soon as she was clear of her hammock, Gagool cast one evil grin upon us, and then, leaning on a stick, hobbled off towards the face of this wall. We followed her till we came to a narrow portal, solidly arched, that looked like the opening of a gallery of a mine. Here Gagool was waiting for us, still with that evil grin upon her horrid face. "'Now, white men from the stars,' she piped, "'great warriors, Inkibu, Buguan, and Makumazan the wise. "'Are you ready?' "'Behold, I am here to do the bidding of my lord the king, "'and to show you the store of bright stones. <laughs> "'We are ready,' I said. "'Good, good, make strong your hearts to bear what ye shall see. "'Comest thou too, Infidus, thou who didst betray thy master?' Infidus frowned as he answered, "'Nay, I come not. It is not for me to enter there. But thou, Gagool, curb thy tongue, and beware how thou dealest with my lords. At thy hands will I require them. And if a hair of them be hurt, Gagool, beest thou fifty times a witch, thou shalt die. Hearest thou?' I hear, Infadus, I know thee. Thou didst ever love big words. When thou was a babe, I remember, thou didst threaten thine own mother. That was but the other day. But fear not, fear not, I live only to do the bidding of the king. I have done the bidding of many kings, Infadus, till in the end they did mine. <laughs> I go to look upon their faces once more, and Twala's also. Come on, come on, here is the lamp. And she drew a large gourd full of oil, and fitted with a rush wick from under her fur cloak. Art thou coming, Fulata? In his villainous kitchen kukuana, in which he had been improving himself under that young lady's tuition. "'I fear, my lord,' the girl answered timidly. "'Then give me the basket.' "'Nay, my lord, whither thou goest, there I go also.' "'The deuce you will,' thought I to myself. "'That may be rather awkward if we ever get out of this.' Without further ado, Gagool plunged into the passage, which was wide enough to admit of two walking abreast, and quite dark. We followed the sound of her voice as she piped to us to come on. 
in some fear and trembling, which was not allayed by the flutter of a sudden rush of wings. Hello, what's that? Hallowed Good. Somebody hit me in the face. Bats, said I. On you go. When, so far as we could judge, we had gone some fifty paces, we perceived that the passage was growing faintly light. Another minute, and we were in perhaps the most wonderful place that the eyes of living man have beheld. Let the reader picture to himself the hall of the vastest cathedral he ever stood in, windowless indeed, but dimly lighted from above, presumably by shafts connected with the outer air, and driven in the roof, which arched away a hundred feet above our heads, and he will get some idea of the size of the enormous cave in which we find ourselves, with the difference that this cathedral, designed by nature, was loftier and wider than any built by man. But its stupendous size was the least of the wonders of the place, for running in rows down its length were gigantic pillars of what looked like ice, but were in reality huge stalactites. It is impossible for me to convey any idea of the overpowering beauty and grandeur of these pillars of white spar, some of which were not less than twenty feet in diameter at the base, and sprang up in lofty and yet delicate beauty, sheer to the distant roof. Others again were in process of formation. On the rock floor there was in these cases what looked, Sir Henry said, exactly like a broken column in an old Grecian temple, whilst high above, depending from the roof, the point of a huge icicle could be dimly seen. Even as we gazed we could hear the process going on, for presently with a tiny splash a drop of water would fall from the far-off icicle onto the column below. On some columns the drops only fell once in two or three minutes, and in these cases it would be an interesting calculation to discover how long, at that rate of dripping, it would take to form a pillar, say, eighty feet by ten in diameter that the process, in at least one instance, was incalculably slow. The following example will suffice to show. Cut on one of these pillars, we discovered the crude likeness of a mummy, by the head of which sat what appeared to be the figure of an Egyptian god, doubtless the handiwork of some old-world laborer in the mine. This work of art, was executed at the natural height at which an idle fellow, be he Phoenician workman or British cad, is in the habit of trying to immortalize himself at the expense of nature's masterpieces, namely about five feet from the ground. Yet at the time that we saw it, which must have been nearly three thousand years after the date of the execution of the carving, the column was only eight feet high, and was still in process of formation, which gives a rate of growth of a foot to a thousand years, or an inch and a fraction to a century. This we knew because, as we were standing by it, we heard a drop of water fall. Sometimes the stalagmites took strange forms, presumably where the dropping of the water had not always been on the same spot. Thus one huge mass, which must have weighed a hundred tons or so, was in the shape of a pulpit, beautifully fretted over outside with a design that looked like lace. Others resembled strange beasts, and on the sides of the cave were fan-like ivory tracings, such as the frost leaves upon a pane. Out of the vast main aisle there opened here and there smaller caves, exactly, Sir Henry said, as chapels 
open out of great cathedrals. Some were large, but one or two, and this is a wonderful instance of how nature carries out her handiwork by the same unvarying laws, utterly irrespective of size, were tiny. One little nook, for instance, was no larger than an unusually big doll's house, and yet it might have been a model for the whole place, for the water dropped, tiny icicles hung, and spar columns were forming in just the same way. We had not, however, enough time to examine this beautiful cavern so thoroughly as we should have liked to do, since, unfortunately, Gagool seemed to be indifferent as to stalactites, and only anxious to get her business over. This annoyed me the more, as I was particularly anxious to discover, if possible, by what system the light was admitted into the cave, and whether it was done by the hand of man or by that of nature that this was done. Also, if the place had been used in any way in ancient times, as seemed probable, However, we consoled ourselves with the idea that we would investigate it thoroughly on our way back, and followed on at the heels of our uncanny guide. On she led us, straight to the top of the vast and silent cave, where we found another doorway, not arched as the first was, but square at the top, something like the doorways of Egyptian temples. "'Are ye prepared to enter the place of death, white men?' asked Gagool, evidently with a view to making us feel uncomfortable. "'Lead on, Macduff,' said Good solemnly, trying to look as though he was not at all alarmed, as indeed we all did except Fulata, who caught Good by the arm for protection. "'This is getting rather ghastly,' said Sir Henry, peeping into the dark passageway. "'Come on, Quartermain, Signoris Prioress. "'We mustn't keep the old lady waiting.' "'And he politely made way for me to lead the van, "'for which inwardly I did not bless him. "'Tap, tap,' went old Gagool's stick down the passage, as she trotted along, chuckling hideously, and still overcome by some unaccountable presentiment of evil, I hung back. "'Come get on, old fellow,' said Good, "'or we shall lose our fair guide.' Thus adjured, I started down the passage, and after about twenty paces found myself in a gloomy apartment some forty feet long, by thirty broad and thirty high, which in some past age evidently had been hollowed by hand labor out of the mountain. This apartment was not nearly so well lighted as the vast stalactite anti-cave, and at the first glance all I could discern was a massive stone table running down its length, with a colossal white figure at its head, and life-sized white figures all round it. Next I discovered a brown thing, seated on the table in the center, and in another moment my eyes grew accustomed to the light, and I saw what all these things were, and was tailing out of the place as hard as my legs could carry me. I am not a nervous man in the general way, and very little troubled with superstitions, of which I have lived to see the folly. But I am free to own that this sight quite upset me, and had it not been that Sir Henry caught me by the collar and held me, I do honestly believe that in another five minutes I should have been outside the stalactite cave, and that a promise of all the diamonds in Kimberley would not have induced me to enter it again. But he held me tight, so I stopped because I could not help myself. Next second, however, his eyes became accustomed to the light, and he let go of me, and began to mop the perspiration off his forehead. 
As for good, he swore feebly, while Fulata threw her arms around his neck and shrieked. Only Gagool chuckled loud and long. It was a ghastly sight. There at the end of the long stone table, holding in his skeleton fingers a great white spear, sat Death himself, draped in the form of a colossal human skeleton, fifteen feet or more in height. High above his head he held the spear, as though in the act to strike. One bony hand rested on the stone table before him, in the position a man assumes on rising from his seat whilst his frame was bent forward so that the vertebrae of the neck and the grinning, gleaming skull projected towards us and fixed its hollow eye-places upon us, the jaws a little open as though it were about to speak. "'Great heavens!' said I faintly at last. "'What can it be?' "'And what are those things?' asked Good, pointing to the white company round the table." "'And what on earth is that thing?' said Sir Henry, "'pointing to the brown creature seated on the table. "'He, he, he!' laughed Gagool. "'To those who enter the hall of the dead, evil comes. "'He, he, he, ha, ha! "'Come, Inkibu, brave in battle, come and see him thou slewest.' "'And the old creature caught Curtis's coat in her skinny fingers.' and led him towards the table. We followed. Presently she stopped and pointed at the brown object seated on the table. Sir Henry looked and started back with an exclamation, and no wonder, for there, quite naked, the head which Curtis's battle-axe had shorn from the body resting on its knees was the gaunt corpse of Twala, the last king of the Kukuanas. Yes, there, the head perched upon the knees, it sat in all its ugliness, the vertebrae projecting a full inch above the level of the shrunken flesh of the neck, for all the world like a black double of Hamilton to gay. Now haste ye, my handmaidens, haste and see how he sits there and glowers with his head on his knee. Over the surface of the corpse there was gathered a thin, glassy film that made its appearance yet more appalling, for which we were at the moment quite unable to account, till presently we observed that from the roof of the chamber the water fell steadily, drip, drop, drip, on to the neck of the corpse, whence it ran down over the entire surface, and finally escaped into the rock, "'through a tiny hole in the table. "'Then I guessed what the film was. "'Twala's body was being transformed into a stalactite. "'A look at the white forms seated on the stone bench "'which ran round that ghastly board confirmed this view. "'They were human bodies indeed, "'or rather they had been human.' Now they were stalactites. This was the way in which the Kukuana people had, from time immemorial, preserved their royal dead. They petrified them. What the exact system might be, if there was any, beyond the placing of them for a long period of years under the drip, I never discovered, but there they sat, iced over and preserved forever by the silicious fluid. Anything more awe-inspiring than the spectacle of this long line of departed royalties, there were twenty-seven of them, the last being Ignosi's father, wrapped each of them in a shroud of ice-like spar, through which the features could be dimly discovered and seated round that inhospitable board with death himself for a host, it is impossible to imagine. 
that the practice of thus preserving their kings must have been an ancient one is evident from the number, which, allowing for an average reign of fifteen years, supposing that every king who reigned was placed here, an improbable thing is some are sure to have perished in battle far from home, would fix the date of its commencement at four and a quarter centuries back. But the colossal death, who sits at the head of this board, is far older than that, and, unless I am mistaken, owes his origin to the same artist who designed the three colossi. He is hewn out of a single stalactite, and, looked at as a work of art, is most admirably conceived and executed. Good, who understands such things, declared that, so far as he could see, the anatomical design of the skeleton is perfect down to the smallest bones. My own idea is that this terrific object was a freak of fancy on the part of some old-world sculptor, and that its presence had suggested to the Kukuanas the idea of placing their royal dead under its awful presidency. Or perhaps it was set there to frighten away any marauders who might have designs upon the treasure chamber beyond. I cannot say. All I can do is describe it as it is, and the reader must form his own conclusion. Such, at any rate, was the white death, and such were the white dead. End of chapter 16